All right. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, German, for allowing me to host this exciting industry panel with six excellent, outstanding uh, leaders uh, in the causal science space in various industries in uh, various industries uh, in business. So I'm I'm Victor Chen. Uh, I'm currently directing the experimental design and causal inference at uh, Fidelity Investments in the U.S. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, Paul and I go way back when I was a faculty at the Copenhagen Business School before I joined the industry. Um, today, I'm joined, it's my great honor to be joined by six outstanding panelists. Uh, without a particular order uh, on the screen, uh, we have uh, Sathya Anand, uh, Director of Data Science and Engineering at Netflix, uh, Benjamin uh, Skrinka, from uh, uh, who's data science manager in experimentation at eBay, Samik Gupta, principal data scientist at experimentation platform uh, from Microsoft, Eric Weber, uh, senior director of data science, experimentation, causal inference, and platform at Stitch Fix, Michael uh, Conagan, uh, Conagan uh, software engineering manager at experimentation platform at Meta, somehow I still want to call it Facebook. Uh, and and Yin Yu, uh, uh, Yin is Applied Research Manager uh, in Experimentation and Cause Inference from LinkedIn. So welcome to uh, this panel. Um, just a, a, a disclaimer I want to uh, announce before we uh, proceed. Uh, today, our panelists uh, will share uh, their personal opinions and ideas. Uh, which may not represent uh, the views of the employers or the colleagues. So we're, we're free to uh, share our own uh, experiences, ideas, uh, as, a, as our opinions. Um, the panel is structured in the following way. Uh, we will spend uh, about an hour or so with the panelists to cover three broad themes of topics uh, that uh, are concerning causal science in the industry. Uh, especially concerning business decisions, including culture, methodology, and infrastructure. And after that, uh, we will hopefully have uh, at least 20 minutes for open Q&As uh, with the attendees. Uh, but if you have questions or comments during the panel discussion, uh, don't wait until the end. Feel free to use the uh, Q&A button uh, on the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen and type your questions and comments and I will uh, sporadically pick up them and ask the panelists to respond. Now, in case you are wondering, as you can tell from my background, I'm sitting in front of Dr. Strange's Sectin Sectoran uh, in the parallel universe. Uh, if you're a Marvel fan, you know what I'm talking about. So this is to remind me how I shall think of causality. To me, causality is the difference that may happen to the same person at the same time from two parallel possibilities that could happen to the person as counterfactual to each other. So this is my perception of causality. And a lot of the work I do, studies, research I do, is around uh, that, that concept uh, that is on my mind. So let me kick off our panel by asking our panelists to define what is your version of causality. So when you are working in your job or in general in the industry, how would you describe causality to, to your friends? Um, and there's no particular order, but on my screen, the magic list, the first on my magic list, on my screen, top left is uh, Satya somehow. Satya, would you like to start? Thank you, Victor, and, and thanks for having me on the panel uh, as well. I think when I, when I think of causality, it's, it's really the... Um, the concept of cause and effect. Uh, and it has to do with, did your action directly lead to some impact or some changes? And whether in the absence of such action, that, that outcome would not have been observed. So I think it's, it's very similar to, to your uh, conception of uh, counterfactuals and, and alternate possibilities. And so in this possibility, you made a change uh, and you're, you're observing an outcome. Is that outcome directly uh, related to the change uh, that you made? Thank you, Sathya. 
uh, the second of my magic list is Ying Ying. What do you think? Sure. Well, to me, um, causality, um, as used in the industry, really has to do with the effect of a feature change or um, an algorithm change on you know metrics of interest. Um, so there could be many things going on in a company. Uh, there could be things going on in the macro um, economy. But if you want to isolate the direct relationship between A and B, um, that's where causality comes in. Very good. Eric? You put me in third position, so I'm like just close enough to say, yeah, what they said. And also, I think there's also understanding both why something happened, did it affect the outcome, and also what can we do about it? I think that that last part, especially operating in a company and in an industry, that comes up all the time, which is there's a lot of interesting questions, but there's also a question of which of these outcomes can we actually change, influence, or manipulate? And I think that is where really tricky nuance comes in to defining some of this. So I'm going to say what they said, but also with some of that, like what can we do about it in a company? I totally agree with you, Eric. So I sometimes call causal analysis prescriptive analysis because uh, it has prescriptive value for what to do. Uh, ben, what do you think? Yeah, um, so anyone who comes from an economics background is probably familiar with the Angris and Pishka book, mostly harmless econometrics, and they have a really nice idea about fundamentally answerable questions, facts, and fundamentally unanswerable questions, fooks. And so you know, we're trying to make something better in the real world, whether it's a policy to prevent teenage pregnancy or to, you know, make better decisions in the corporate world. And often we have questions that are very poorly posed. And so I think that there's a real art to posing your questions so you can answer meaningful questions that get you to a good decision that's going to bring about a welfare improvement in the world. So you know, at this point in the list, it's kind of hard to say something new. And I think that also a lot of us tend to operate in a daily basis in the potential outcomes framework because we're lucky enough to be able to run experiments. And that's an easy and tractable, tractable way. Um, we just heard the keynote speaker who would say that, like, we're all Satanists because we're using potential outcomes and we should be using his structural causal model view of the world, um, which is also very good if you can't run an experiment. And it can also be combined with experiments to kind of deepen your understanding of causality, particularly if you have to deal with things in a messy world. Thank you, Ben. Well, speaking of experiment, we have the uh, last two names who are actually responsible for building experimentation capacities in their companies. So Samik and Michael, what do you think? How, how would you describe or define causality in your world? Samik, you want to go first? Sure. Um... There are very few things left to say after um, all the panelists have already spoken. So I'll say like, I agree with all of them um, in the view of like, what is causality? Um, I guess the the biggest, um, like the simplest way I kind of think of, especially in Seattle is it's raining out there, you have umbrellas. So did the umbrella cause the rain or did the rain cause the umbrella to come out? You just see data, uh, both of them are co-occurring. So there's no way to figure out which way does the causal cause and effect goes. And this is what causality or causal inference helps us tease apart that, hey, because of rain, the umbrellas came out. And um, this enforces, like gives you a sense of uh, accountability and ownership of your results or your decisions that you make in terms of the impact. So you can uh, really use causal inference to say that because of the decision, or we are making this decision because we know that this will cause X, Y, and Z. Okay, that's very interesting analogy. Uh, so Michael, I don't know if uh, the rain and the umbrella resonate with you and, and folks yeah. in, uh, in California, but what do you think? Yeah, that, that example is also one that I always come back to when I'm thinking of things, but the way I think of it is actually a lot more like your, your, your example. I like to imagine like an elementary school science experiment where you have like the volume of the, the water and the length and the 
temperature is exactly the same in the two different setups and you make a small change and you see what happens and that's how you know that like that small change is the cause of the 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 effect you're seeing so that there's a lot of things happening in the world and in the business and ideally you can clone the world and have like this alternative version where everything is exactly the same except for this one small change so we can't have that obviously um, but like we try to do um the best we can um, with the methods and these experimentation systems that we built. Very nice. Maybe one day we could have a meta. I mean, by meta, I mean a meta universe where we can put all our assumptions of changes to the uh, the alternative universe and see <laughs> if that really is causing any changes, right? I mean, and you're the right person to talk to. Perfect. <laughs> so now, uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, um, for the excellent uh, setting up of the scene, for causality. Um, now, um, I want to start with culture. Um, so one thing, so I, I recently had a transition from academia to uh, industry, and then the the very obvious change I've been encountering is is culture, right? So same for causality. So we have data science. So we see the emergence of data science, big data uh, tools, machine learning, uh, uh, and then causality. So in again, uh, we don't have to represent our own companies. It's just our personal opinions and experiences. So how, why should people care about culture, uh, care about causality from a cultural perspective? So why is that an important thing? Um, again, I'm gonna go backward. So let's start with Michael this time. Why should we care? Yeah, I'm um, similar to, I guess, like what, how we define causality, like you're, investing a lot of um, resources and time in making these ch changes to, to, to your system or to your, to your business. And you want to know if like the change you made is actually what's causing the metrics you want to go up. Like it, it could be revenue, number of users and whatnot. And if you don't know, actually, then you're just like taking shots in the, in the blind. And, and one of the, the best ways for that is experimentation and, and causal inference. Okay, so it, it could, in other words, I think my reading of your answer is we could have a sense of responsibility. We know who or what is responsible for, for what effect, right? We could, then yeah, that's important yeah. in, in, the, in the industry. We need to have responsibility. Perfect. Yeah. Summit, what do you think? So yeah, I'm going backward this time. Yeah, um, so actually, um, just recently, I've thought about it a lot. Um, we published an article in Harvard Data Science Review with um, Yal Boino, um, assistant yeah. professor. And for the record, I've read that. OK. <laughs> so I'm going to quote that, that article um, and build on what Michael just said. So there are, I think of it as two levels of why you should have, um, why you should care about causality. One is just for your individual experiment or your individual decision. You can be much more confident that your decision will cause X, Y, and Z. Two, um, in that same frame, you can also limit the risk, right? So you only expose a very small percentage of your population to, to the new treatment. Not that you're, you, you were shoddy in your implementation, but you're, you have humility that even after our best efforts, sometimes we don't know how our customers would react to certain things. So you start with a very small, uh, exposure and make sure that there is no negative impact. So that's at the experiment level or a single decision level. But when you use it at scale, it has a cultural uh, advantage. One, it allows you to make consistent decisions regardless of who's, at, who's in the room while making those decisions. So, and that happens through defining really good metrics, a goal or overall evaluation criteria metrics that align with the product strategy. And two, um, it also makes this whole decision-making process a little bit more scrutinizable because now you have these key metrics and everybody's making those decisions in a standardized manner. So you can you can reevaluate and study that did this decision strategy work. And lastly, um, it just opens up doors for innovation. So um, it enables that growth mindset where we don't start with like, we know exactly what our users want and let me spec it out to the last detail but more like we want to engage our users or whatever goal we have. 
and we're going to try our put our best foot forward, but we know that we we may not succeed in the first time. So we're going to try a lot of ideas, and um, that kind of percolates down into the organization, and people try a lot more ideas and um, have a way to know which one would succeed and build on those. Okay, great. Yeah, and by the way, that's a great article. Uh, I shared it with many of my friends also on LinkedIn. Uh, ben, you are ne next on my list. I know you have been educating the public a lot uh, on this topic, so we ask the question in a different way. So have you encountered any cases where people say, no, we don't care about causality? Yeah, actually, that's a really great um, question. And I mean, first, you're like, well, this is obvious. Like, I'm a scientist. Like, why wouldn't you care about causality? You have to be have mentally challenged. Um, but, you know, then you meet a lot of people who really don't run experiments well. And if you step back and you think about their incentives, they have different incentives than you do, which aren't necessarily doing what's best for the company. You know, they may be interested in keeping their job. They may be interested in having an easy life. Um, or more importantly, um, a good example, this is a colleague at Walmart ran a great um, survey of his to understand why people weren't running more experiments there. And he said, like, why don't you run more experiments? And everything at the top of the list was, um, you know, I've got too much stuff to do. Um, it doesn't really matter. And all these things were like behavioral, cultural um, reasons for not doing it. None of them were technical, like the platform could be better. Um, we can't me measure heterogeneous treatment effects. And so um, putting an emphasis in causality to Soman's point is really important because you need to set up the incentives so that managers are compensated for paying attention to causality because we know that it on well-optimized sites, roughly 10% of new ideas are good. Um, that's the order of magnitude. So if we don't pay attention to ca causality, we're gonna ship a lot of bad features and actually take a big step backwards. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we need a strong incentive to justify the cost of, of, uh, of doing causality, right? Thank you, thank uh, you, uh, Eric. Oh, go ahead, Ben. No, I, I let someone else talk. I've talked too much. Okay, Eric, we can come back to so, you that later. One thing I've thought about recently is causality can kind of take a back seat when everything is going up and to the right, when things are going really well and business is growing and everything's great. And you're like, okay, we could have maybe made that a bit better. But in general, we're all making money. But now we're in a situation where we're having contraction or flat year over year metrics, whatever it might be. And it enables, I think, experimentation, causality focus enables, you know, echoing what others have said, things to be a bit more scrutinizable. It democratizes evidence, I think, in a way that can combat a really like powerful person in the room driving a specific narrative to push a product development. And so I think it's especially important in the environment that we're in across tech right now is you're able to really look more closely at these decisions because it may be the difference between growth and contraction where in the past it may have been, okay, we grew a little bit less than we would have otherwise. Okay. I, I agree. Thank you. Uh, uh, in, in, would you like to add something? Sure. So in general, I think the question of causality comes up when we have more than one options and we're looking for a data-driven way to help us decide which path to take. Um, a culture of causality can help a company understand um, what are the ramifications of each decision um, before potentially making them and um, causing um, you know, potential widespread harm. Um, so causality basically is a way for uh, organizations to make data-informed decisions. Okay, awesome. Safia? Yeah, I, I think what all other panelists said, it, it resonates fairly well, especially Ben's point about uh, incent aligning incentives uh, for the what's over best for the organization overall. Uh, I'd say that... Um, now, there are many factors that go into decision making, including strategy, regulatory constraints, competition, and, and so on and so forth. And if as an organization, you believe that data should be one of the inputs to that, to, to decision making, then I'd argue that causality is probably the most important factor within how data uh, affects decision making 
across your organization. And then for all the reasons that the other panelists mentioned on adding certainty to the process, keeping people accountable uh, for the decisions that they make and, and having justifications for why you do some, you, 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 you make a certain change. Now I'll add that you don't, this does not mean that, or at least I don't subscribe to the view that you always need to do what the results of the A-B test tell you or what the results of the causal analysis tell you to do. There may be other very good reasons, strategic, regulatory, competitive threats for you to do something that, that goes against what the numbers are telling you. But at least having the causal analysis framework or decision framework in place puts the emphasis on the decision maker to justify why they are going against what the numbers are numbers are saying. So it's 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 a pretty powerful accountability mechanism as well. Yeah. Yeah. So now Ben, let's let's go back to the point that you made and then several other panelists also resonated. Uh aligning the incentives. So so can there be any policies or procedures in the decision process? so we can implement this alignment. Again, for now, I don't call the name. So if you have thoughts, feel free to jump in and feel free to, to interrupt. But Ben, would you like to start, follow up on okay, that point? Yeah. I, I'm an economist, so for those of you who don't know that, so I think a lot about incentives. My, in fact, my wife even now says, um, oh, if that's incentive compatible. So, you know, we would like to make you know, good behavior designed into the mechanism so that people, you know, willingly participate in doing the right thing for the company or the government or society. And so one of the things we did at eBay that was very effective in building more maturity was we did a maturity, we built a maturity model. So we kind of benchmarked where we were against industry throughout the experimentation life cycle on a variety of dimensions. We did it for all the different key verticals like customer marketing, performance marketing, on-site marketing, and so on. And this allows you to put a number on something that is kind of a fuzzy and tangible. And then you can kind of, and we produce this publicly, we track it quarterly. And so we can see which groups are doing well, which are lagging, and we can use this to try to push people forward. We can do things like, did people log in the experimentation platform why they made a decision? This is important because it allows us to learn and do meta-analysis to detect systematic problems. Okay, so I wanna read out one, one comment um, uh, one of the attendees uh, put in the, uh, in the uh, Q&A, which is related to what we are discussing now. So uh, is causality used more in products or for production strategies to assist decisions on role mapping and so on? I think, or to simplify the question is, how is causality implemented in, in the production process? So, so anyone would like to jump in? Again, I, I won't call names from now on. Feel free to jump in. I think uh, I can say for at least LinkedIn, um, you know, ex experimentation, um, which is, you know, the gold standard for causality is really used to drive um, most, if not all uh, production decisions. So when we productionize a feature, when we productionize a new algorithm, uh, we first tested against the existing feature, the existing algorithm to, to see if it's actually better. Um, and then we um, ramp the new variant. Um, if, it, if it does indeed um, you know, do better for our members, our customers. Um, and so in that sense, um, you know, causality is um, a major component of um, the production decision-making. Okay, and Michael? Yeah, um, similarly at Meta, there's a really, really strong ingrained culture of running experiments for almost every single change that we make to our products or our systems, anywhere from like a small change of a variable in how the system operates to something you actually see see as a user will always be experimented on. And the decision-making process is really, really 
focused on these experimentation results. Um, of course, in, in real practice, it's not that simple because you, every experiment you run, there's several metrics who might be up, several metrics might be down. So at the end of the day, the persons on the team will make a call based on the experiment um, results, um, but still um, everything is focused on causality and experimentation for the most part. Okay, awesome. So uh, I, I want to read out one more uh, question in the in the attendees Q&A, which I think is related to culture. Uh, we, we could use that to close out the culture uh, section so we can move on to methodology. So how do we keep politics out of causal modeling, such as experimentation or cause analysis? Give you one specific example. So as data scientists, we want, you may want to be rigorous, take time for experimentation, for causal inference, before rule out the next best uh, uh, products or features or changes, as you mentioned, Michael, right, and, and also Ian. But then the marketing people, campaign people say, oh, we have the best products uh, in the world. Let's rule out to everybody. So how do we keep such internal competition out? How do we keep the politics out to get things right? Again, anyone can jump in. I'm going to be, I don't think you can fully keep it out. I think there's also, if you look at the companies that we represent, we probably index in a particular way about how we handle these things. But there's a huge continuum of like how this goes down in companies. And I think the important thing to understand is like you have to have some first principles about how you want to operate, but also understand that in some situations, it may you may not get the outcome that you want, right? Even if you have those like repeated principles of this is how what we're going to push for, this we're gonna try to be as you know, adhere as much as we can to our causal framework you have to allow for a different set of outcomes and understand like in some situations, trade uh, business may just decide to do something. And just because you lose once doesn't mean that you did the wrong thing. And I think that's like having an understanding of what are your first principles is really important because otherwise if you just judge by outcomes, you're, <laughs> you'll probably get pretty frustrated after a while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it. your hands is up. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, I, I I agree with Eric. Like, think of it as a marathon rather than a sprint. So you might um, have some aberrations, but I think process and overall evaluation criteria can really help. So uh, and the kind of two sides of the same thing. The main thing is to make sure you have a falsifiable hypothesis before you start an experiment. Often politics starts after you've seen the experiment results, and then you try to fit a hypothesis that matches those experiment results. So if you can have a falsifiable hypothesis beforehand um, that is well-documented, that helps. And um, when you think of it at, at scale, you want every experiment or every person in an organization towards to be pushing towards the same direction, to row that boat in that same direction. So you should have like some overall evaluation criteria metrics for a product already predefined before even somebody thought of that particular feature they might be really attached to. And um, that way you can be more objective about, okay, this is the direction we want to take. This is where our goals, the results might be contrary to them. And then it, it becomes harder for you to argue against that. You still might be able to, and there might still be good re uh, reasons to, but uh, at least that process acts as a gate. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to have the falsifiable hypothesis documented beforehand, before running an analysis, uh, just like writing a doctoral thesis. Uh, I still remember <laughs> when I started writing academic papers uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, same process. It, it's good to know what uh, we are using that language in, in the industry now. Uh, Safia, uh, to you, and then we move on to methodology after that. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree with what Eric and Somit said high level, but I think the key to understand is like it's it's not easy to boil decision making down to a set of numbers uh, all the time. Uh, there's a bunch of other criteria that, that go on uh, in the world around you, in the business around you. There's business strategic reasons, there's regulatory reasons, a competitor may be doing something that you want to protect against. 
not all of it is measurable and not all of it is uh, is directly dictated by the numbers that you see and you can measure in an experiment. So I, I think as, as data scientists and especially people who, who want to make or help make uh, more rigorous decisions, I think we need to be humble and, and try to absorb as much of the context as we can uh, from our stakeholders and, and the folks who make the decisions or our owners of the products and, and business areas. Uh, and I think it it all comes down to transparency and and context sharing, right? So you may think that just because a product manager made a decision that went against the numbers that it's somehow politics uh, or the the uh, the incentives are not aligned, uh, but you may just not have the full context for why a certain decision uh, decision was made. So I think we also need to have a little little bit of uh, uh, you know we should we should be humble to say, okay, uh, you know, this is a way to make a decision, or this is what the numbers are saying. Uh, but how you make the decision mm -hmm. may go beyond what uh, what the what the test results say. That's an example. Mm -hmm. And people may not agree on the uh, matrix to focus on, right? Before before discussing causality, uh, I think Sathya, thank you. You 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 kind of uh, already uh, foreshadowed the next topic I want to touch on uh, about methodology. So. Well, in general, there are two broad methods to get causality from data, right? Uh, as you can tell from a title, one is experiment. And the second is cause inference from observational data without experiment or with some imperfect experiments. Now, uh, on methodology, maybe we can continue on the uh, the topic you, you started, Satya, uh, on matrix. So what are some of the best practices to get clarity on matrix? Uh, to start uh, causal analysis. And then we, we go first start with Satya and then anybody can jump in after. Yeah, thank you. And I think Somit's probably the, the expert here on, on, on that front. Uh, but I, I'd say, and, and a lot of what we've learned is inspired by what he and his team have done over the years uh, at, at Microsoft as well. So I, I'd say the, the overall evaluation criteria, not having a North Star that your organization aspires towards and that everybody's aligned towards uh, really helps. Now, obviously that metric may not be sensitive or it may not even be possible to, to move it directly as part of any change that, that you may make. So you have to get into proxy metrics, guardrail metrics, uh, figure out what's sensitive, but still aligned with long-term lifetime value or long-term revenue that, uh, that your organization may care about. But I think as long as as you know you have the overall, here's like a hierarchy of metrics that we want to follow, um, and everybody's roughly aligned towards it, and you have the processes in place to make decisions and debate and and share context throughout the organization. I think I think those are the key ingredients uh, that go into this. Awesome, awesome. Anybody else who want to? I think Samit's name was mentioned. Samit. Um. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Satya. Um, just building up on uh, building on what you said. Um, this is where, if you've been running experiments in the past, um, this the scrutinizable aspect of your decision making comes into play. You can use your past experiments as a test data set and say that if these are the new OEC or overall, overall evaluation criteria metrics, which one of these experiments would I have shipped? And it doesn't need to align with the past ship decisions of those experiments. And that's where the strategy angle comes into play. Like your product strategy might have changed. You might be making different trade-offs now between top level metrics, but it gives you a little bit more um, data-driven way um, to think about uh, what metrics to focus on and um, allows for multiple ideas. Because when you just think about ideas for metrics in, in, in a vacuum, every idea looks really good. But then when you actually try it out on previous experiments, which hopefully are representative of some of the future experiments you're gonna do, um, it, it really gives you that um, some grounding into like data and understand like, will they be sensitive? Do we need a proxy? And uh, one other quick thing um, I wanna say is, especially for metrics, um, uh, I have uh, put put together a, a framework called Steady. Um, it's, it's on our, platform uh, blog post. So if you're looking at a metric, it should be sensitive, it should be trustworthy, it should be efficient, it should be debuggable, it should be interpretable, and it should be inclusive. 
So those six kind of um, properties kind of, I summarize them as steady. So I would definitely look for those properties in any top level uh, critical set of metrics that we want to have for a product. Okay, thank you, Summit. I'll definitely check that out, steady on your on the blog. Uh, ben, your hands is up. Cool, yes. Yeah. So just incentives, again, a metric is an incentive, right? If you start measuring it, that's gonna alter behavior because people will start optimizing to that. And you may decide to let anarchy rule and let each group choose their own metrics, or you may decide that in your organization, you need some level of coordination and there should be some or limited set of metrics that the whole organization is going to optimize to so we don't have random optimization where different groups are canceling each other out. Um, that's really important to look for. Uh, and the Microsoft papers that Summit and his team have worked on are great, like steady in the measuring metrics. Uh, there's also a great Yandex paper where they were able to like create an optimal OEC using this experimentation corpus of labeled trustworthy experiments to then create like a optimal OEC that combines several metrics that is both more sensitive and has better um, directionality. Um, and so that's another nice way to optimize things potentially. But all this requires the an organization that is sufficiently sophisticated that you can have trustworthy labeled experiments. So you're running degradation experiments or replication so that you have high confidence in what the ground truth is. And not every organization is that mature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and by the way, thank you for the other, other reference of that article. I would definitely check that out. Now, okay, now once we get clarity on the matrix to start with, uh, that's only the beginning. Of, of cause analysis, right? Um, and 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 that, but that that's a very important beginning. We can align better align the incentives with the other areas of business. If if people focus on the same uh, matrix, and and then people generally try to get the ground truth on what impacts will be on those metrics. But but what's next? Uh, actually, related to uh, 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 Professor Pro's talk earlier. They generate two two kinds of ways to uh, to anal analyze causality. One, we have a sort of representation of the of the world in in terms of a model or causal graph, and then we sort of map the evidence onto the model, or we just design experiments and then to compare the outcomes and to build evidence from ground up. So, any thoughts on that? So, what's next after we have? So we have data, or we don't have data, we have matrix we want to focus on. What's the next step to start uh, getting causality? Get the ground truth. Ian? Uh, yeah, I can, I can say something. I think the next step is a proper um, experiment design or a proper um, analysis design if you're going the observational causal route. Um, experiments um, sometimes are, you know, fairly expensive. They take time. Uh, they can potentially expose our um, customers or members to um, a, a bad experience. Um, and so making sure that um, whenever we run an experiment, um, the experiment is designed in a way that can actually inform future decision making that we actually learn uh, what we want from the experiment um, and that it's sufficiently powered to um, get us the, you know, as precise of a result as we want um, is really important. Okay. And then I think I saw a hand just now, but it disappeared. And that was me. Did you raise uh, your hand? Okay. <laughs> that was me. Um, yeah, I think, um, um, I agree with all that Yanin has said uh, here. Um, just to add on to that, um, it kind of, especially if you're starting off with, just starting with experimentation and you just know, getting that clarity on like what you want to optimize and to be something that you can communicate in a way that everybody can understand and make that same optimization is a big, big win. Um, then after that, you may want to like start a flywheel of 
A/B testing or experimentation. You 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 run a well-designed experiment, as Union talked about, and then you hopefully you would get like interesting insights um, that would uh, allow you to create more incentives to um, invest in that platform, and then you run um, find more hypotheses based on your existing results as well as other brainstorming, and run more experiments. So um, if you kind of I'd like to think of value of experimentation in that uh, potential outcomes framework model itself like so hopefully because you ran an experiment you're making some decision that you wouldn't have made otherwise that's the value of experiments and early on in your product if you're not run a lot of experiments you 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 would get those like uh, insights pretty quickly and that would like spur more investments and you would run more and more experiments and test more and more ideas Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Safia, and then Eric. Yeah, just to add to what Union and Somit said, um, uh, by by asking everyone to focus on what the business problems are and and what the priorities are of the business, I think if uh, it's it's easy to to run analyses or or run experiments when nobody's looking, or or you know the business doesn't care about what part of the product you're running experiments on. You can get away with with a lot of stuff, but I think to run a successful experimentation program, or or if you want this this discipline to be successful in your company, I would say engage with the business, understand what the priorities are, what questions are they looking to answer, and and then have a candid conversation about whether whether experiments or causal analysis is even the right tool to 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 answer that question, right? And and so. As long as you have that debate and discussion going on with the business, it, it builds mutual trust, which in turn then allows them to trust your results more. Or when you have something to ask off of, off of them, I think that dialogue helps build that foundation of trust to, to, to make the program successful. Mm -hmm. Eric? Yeah, building on what others have said, I think there's two things. One, try to bring business partners, whoever that might be, along for the ride to the degree that you can, right? You can't involve everyone at every stage, but I think working toward it being a partnership rather than just something that one part of the business does can solve a lot of problems downstream. And I think as part of that is to be really explicit about the costs of an experiment from a time perspective, from potential risk to customer perspective. There's a lot of different ways to talk about cost, but I think that's one thing that the more explicit you can be, I think it's easier for people to understand, is the trade-off here worth it? Is it worth it for us to take three weeks or four weeks to power this experiment to a sufficient degree, or should we be doing something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's time for me to read out some uh, questions in the q and I think there's one question that is related to a lot of topics we've covered, uh, especially on matrix. So what, what if we have some competing or uh, multiple competing or alternative uh, performance matrix? For example, some are short-term outcome matrix for A-B testing, but then there's some long-term goals of the company. So how do we incorporate those competing or alternative measurements in, in our method? Anyone would like to start? Ben? So some of the long-term stuff, you may just not be able to move. It may not be very sensitive. And, you know, if you have an experiment that, you know, ideally you want your experiment to run in one or two weeks, so you don't have to worry about macroeconomic drift. Uh, then you need to worry if you have good surrogate or proxy metrics. And it all comes back to a lot of the work uh, Sumit did, right? We want steady metrics. We want things that are sensitive and directional. And if you built your labeled experimentation corpus, then you can evaluate these metrics in a data-driven way and life should be good. Mm -hmm. Summit. And yeah, Michael. Just to add to what Benjamin said, um, I think there are two aspects to it. One is um, I always think you should focus on the long-term, even the short-term metrics. When you think of them in the long-term, a lot of these problems go away. Like uh, for instance, in one of our papers, we talk about um, uh, early OEC metric for Bing. So we wanted to increase query share, but instead of focusing on that short-term metric of like number of queries 
done in an A-B test, increasing that. That would have been bad because um, I think ben, uh, Benjamin mentioned that some metrics can have wrong incentives. So you can increase the number of queries in an experiment by showing really bad results where people have to reformulate queries and then um, uh, there'll be a large bump in number of queries. So, but if you think about it in long term, if you ran that experiment for say a very long period of time, you won't see those queries increase. So a better proxy or a better uh, measure of unit was the how many tasks a user is able to perform using your um, search engine in this case. And uh, a proxy for that was sessions. And um, I believe even LinkedIn at some point used, used sessions. I don't know if they do now, but uh, that became like a good indicator for long term, uh, as well as kind of resolve that uh, tension between the short term imbalance you might see. Second is tra strategic. Like it's not about um, like the, the goal has to be defined by the team, right? So are you focusing on engagement a lot? Are you focusing on depth of engagement? Are you focusing on monetization? Are you focusing on performance? So those trade-offs ideally should be made uh, once for all experiments. I think, again, uh, I think Benjamin was saying that so that different teams don't start making different trade-offs and canceling out each other. So that's the strategic aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, on the long term thing, I also agree that like every organization or team should focus ultimately on the, the long term, but the average experiments may last a, about a month. So one good practice that a lot of um, companies doing, including Meta, is something at least at Meta called long term holdout, where every team uh, might have one small experiment, essentially that a small 1% of the population doesn't get anything all anything that 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 particular organization or team has launched in the next six months or even up to a, a year which can um help prevent um small experiments um um that optimize for the short term to know if they also optimize for the, the, the long term eventually um and then on the topic of trade-offs between organizations i agree with some that um obviously these should be discussed in advance and ideally in a very larger organization like Meta, things will and often do cancel each, each other. And um, so we also have a concept we call metrics de defense, where we sh show actually these cancellations where this organization ran something that made their metrics go up, which makes the other organization's metrics go down and it's 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 oftentimes hard to make these decisions automatically based on numbers but at least then these organizations should start to discuss um and have a strategy a path going forward and make a decision on these mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's interesting it sounds like a permanent long-term permanent holdout which is not included in any any experiments so we see what is going on we can use that as a, as a sort of universal control group to compare with uh, everything else. It's interesting. Um, uh, Satya, you have something to add? Uh, just on long-term holdouts, like again, there's there's no free lunch, right? So I think you, you have to be cognizant that you may be giving a, a degraded experience to 1% of your users for a very long period of time, and they may not be benefiting from the, the improvements that you've rolled out uh, along along the way. Uh, so there's pros and cons. The pros are, of course, you get to study the long-term effects. You you understand seasonality. There's a whole bunch of benefits, but uh, you also have to be cognizant. It's it may not be the right move for every organization. Right, right. Well, I'm happy as long as I am not in that one percent permanent holdout uh, <laughs> on my Facebook. Anyway, so uh, okay, the last question uh, before we move on to the next uh, topic. Um, so oh, methodology. I think this is pretty unique place where we have a large number of academic researchers, innovators, and industry practitioners, protect, practitioners together in, in the same place. So um, are there any desirable innovations that, that you, you, you guys would like to see to come from the cutting edge research from, from uh, academia that uh, we can use, we wanna use in the industry, like any, any, any problems that cannot be solved 
by the existing methods now? Would we, we like to see any innovations in the coming years around the academic, academic space? So there are two areas where um, I think we could definitely use um, improvements. Uh, one is experimentation velocity, um, and that has to do with the speed by which we um, are able to come to an experiment result. Um, so experiment velocity, for example, is um, especially a problem in enterprise experimentation, where the unit of randomization is um, a advertiser, a company, et cetera. Um, so we have very small sample. And so for us to get a sufficiently powered um, result, we would have to wait a very long time. Um, and, you know, a slower experiment really is, the, is a bottleneck for um, innovation. So we're always looking for ways to speed up our experimentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other area where I think um, we are also looking for, um, you know, new methodology is in the area of privacy. So uh, recent changes in uh, privacy has uh, forced us to revamp the way that we do um, experiments um, and also observational causal method methodologies. Um, and so, um, you know, a natural, um, a natural thing to do, a natural um, direction to innovate is to um, basically, um, you know, develop methodologies that accommodate um, the, the privatized um, landscape that a lot of uh, industries are moving into. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me summarize. One is a speed. But actually, more ultimately, it's a sample. How do we get power sample? And the second is um, uh, privacy protection. Yes. Right. Okay. Summit. Uh, so, um, around the end of 2018, um, I was lucky enough to uh, host a summit with like 13 different organizations and um, we kind of discussed this topic and uh, we have a paper on top challenges in the industry. We have a lot of papers, Summit. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we, we like to uh, contribute to the uh, community. Um, so I, I definitely recommend folks to uh, read that because I think a lot of those challenges there are, are still uh, unmapped. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the ones that come up uh, often are, I think one that uh, Michael was referring to is that we want to focus on the long term, but we need like really good like proxy metrics or surrogate metrics that we can observe in the short term. Um, second is uh, fairness. Um, a lot of like experiment analysis, um, it wouldn't be optimal if you just look at the average treatment effect and ship it to everybody. You sh we need to be cognizant of like how different important segments of the product are reacting to this and how do we identify those heterogeneous treatment effects and ensure, um, I know LinkedIn has done some work even on fairness, like can, uh, is that decision fair to everybody? And um, the uh, other part, um, Union has al already mentioned uh, like privacy and differential privacy. Um, uh, on top of that, I would also mention uh, like deviations from the traditional A-B testing um, framework. So we assume like like the um, sattva assumptions are true, that everybody's response to a given treatment is independent of how others are aligned to or assigned to the treatment or control. But a lot of times there are like network interactions between products, or it might be because a lot of products are collaborative in nature. Or it might be because our, I like you might have multiple cookies on the same device, those kind of things. So those break our assumptions. And how do we know? Um, first of all, like how do we know is there a red flag that can be reliably raised whenever there is a problem with the analysis? And then second would be what do we do if we end up in those situations? Okay, interesting, uh, Eric. Would you like to close out this uh, final question on this topic? Yeah, this is, I think, less about methodological innovation, though I echo what everyone has said. But we're talking about, a, even from this panel, a very specific subset of companies. 
and how we operate and how we do things. I think it's really important to actually understand how other companies who don't have the same infrastructure setups, how they how they actually make choices and decisions and what evidence they're open to using. Like it might not, it's not really about methodology, but I think it's really important to document like what are the costs of not doing things this way in companies that don't operate in the same way that we do. And I think there's not a lot about that because we tend to go more to the methodological side of things. But I think it's important, especially from a broader industry perspective. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an excellent point, Eric. So I, I just realized we, we are just a very small subset of large corporations, which maybe at a high maturity of uh, cause analysis, uh, uh, cycle in terms of inf infrastructures and, and capacity. So in general, let's move on to tech topic and let me follow up on that, uh, the point you, you just made, Eric. So how do we, how do organizations build up to capacity? And by capacity, I think it means two things. One is infrastructure, right? The platforms, um, engineering, and also people, uh, the kind of skills we want when, when, when hiring people. So let's start with the, the engineering side of the of the equation. Um, I noticed that several of, 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 of panelists here are leading the development of experimentation platforms. So for those who don't know, what is an experimentation platform? What, what does it do? Maybe start with uh, Michael and Summit and then uh, Ben, Eric. Yeah, so an experimentation platform, at least um, the way we have it at Meta is, um, it allows you to run an experiment. Um, it takes care of like having an A version and B version. It takes care of logging. Um, it will take care of like ingesting the metrics that you've logged. And ultimately it will um, do the methodologies um, that we have to give you an experimental result of this metric was moved by this much um, up or down. It may do all kinds of additional advanced methodologies. It will also check things like power. Do you have enough sample size? Um, and not every experimentation platform will do this, but at least at Meta, it also provides you a UI, an easy to use UI for you to, to do all of, the, all of this, such that experimentation is democratized and these centralized any team even if they don't have the most um experience can go come to this experimentation platform it'll let you know that you need to have a hypothesis what are your metrics here's the experiments do you want it to be one percent or two percent it'll guide you through it after a month or a time or when you have enough power it'll say here's the results that you asked for and here's the how we think you can make a decision Okay, so is that platform uh, accessible also for the users, for for Facebook users, or is it sort of internal? No, no, this would just just be for internal engineers. Internal. Okay, gotcha. And Summit. Gotcha. Summit. So, so what is Microsoft experimentation platform? I know, you, I know, yeah, you, um... you you have that mentioned in several papers. So feel free to cite those papers again. <laughs> Um, I, actually, we do have a paper on this one as well. It's called uh, Anatomy of a Large-Scale Experimentation Platform. Um, I'm going to quote from that. So generally, like you can think of an experiment having two sides, the online side and the offline side. The, and the experimentation platform, as Michael was saying, it should enable that scale for uh, folks to run experiments in a responsible manner within the entire organization or whoever the customers are for that platform. Um, the online side is basically think of it that you need to first configure your experiment. You have to decide what's your, who are, what's the audience or the population that you want to run the experiment on. What are the two or three variants you want to test? So how do you configure them? And then what is your ramp up strategy? Like how do you uh, ensure that you, uh, you you are putting guardrails uh, to uh, before you expose to a lot of people, and then there's the experiment execution side in the online um, 
uh, side of things. That is where you're actually randomizing uh, the experiment units into treatment and control. It needs to be done in an efficient manner, unbiased manner. Um, and um, lastly, you should an experimentation platform should be able to control exposure. So from all the way to zero to 100, if you want to ship, right? On the offline side, you want to define metrics. So uh, what are your main metrics? Um, ideally, you should already have a metric set that you can leverage, but you might want to define additional metrics um, on top. Then you would want to have um, some way for the product logs to like connect with those metric definitions and compute those metrics and have an analysis uh, out, like what we call internally a scorecard, which tells you like how the treatment is doing compared to control. And um, even have some like um, emergency breaks as part of that uh, analysis where it can send you alert email saying like, hey, this metric is really tanking or seems to be going crazy. Take a look or we're gonna shut it down. And um, finally, um, uh, you get the final analysis and you make that ship decision. And um, so the experiment platform is enabling all of that for uh, for our customers across multiple products in Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Awesome, sounds so interesting. Safia, and, and actually every all the, all the panelists feel free to uh, to jump in if that's in your in your alley. Yeah, uh, Safia? thanks. So my teams my, my teams don't run an experimentation platform, but we are consumers of of the Netflix experimentation platform. I think a few other things that we think about as consumers are really, um, who is the audience uh, for the platform? Is it uh, other engineering teams? Is it uh, science teams? Or is it product managers? And is it, are, are these like business owners? So depending on who you decide uh, is the primary audience for your experimentation platform, you may go with a different set of features that makes it point and click really easy or provides different layers of, of modularization and customizability. Uh, a good example from uh, from the science side is really that when you're innovating, not all metrics are usually already defined and computed as part of the standardized pipelines uh, that that Somet uh, mentioned on the on the back end. So you often need new metrics to to be computed just for that experiment. And if that feature or product doesn't roll out, those metrics are not even needed sometimes uh, after the life of the experiment. So you don't want to invest in building it, building out a full standardized pipeline while you are still testing things out. So having the proper sort of hooks for scientists to write their own metrics and also be computed as part of the pipeline is is an example that we would look for as science teams as an example. So I think thinking about who's the audience for the platform is also a, a good good axis of uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ben. Yeah, I think we could probably all talk about this for days, and many of my colleagues have written a lot of papers on that. But let me just offer a few points. First of all, I don't think your experimentation will be any better in your culture. So even if you build like the greatest ever platform, you're going to be limited by your culture. If you have people who are, you know, overriding results with their spider sense uh, and not trusting data, you won't be happy. And for, for those in the audience who are starting out at smaller companies, you might think, oh, Maybe we'll start using some third-party experimentation product, and that might get you going quickly, but you might also want to worry about, you know, am I protecting my user data? You may have latency problems, and ultimately your experimentation platform is going to want to be tailored for your business problems. So you probably want to start simply and build something that's your own that works for your needs. Um, and as Soma talked about, right, your experimentation platform, ultimately, if you've got the resources and it makes sense, you want to be able to track the entire experimentation process through the whole life cycle from I have an idea all the way to reporting at the end and taking care of all the important things like power calculations and such. Um, there's a great Netflix paper about this where they talk about separation of concerns, which is really helps you scale effectively, which is building some generic capability to run science in the platform so engineers can focus on what engineers do best which is building infrastructure scientists can focus on what they do best which is analysis um, so for instance if my platform initially just supports a t-test 
if I want to add something like quantile treatment effects, so I can look at the distribution of how people respond to treatment, like a scientist should hopefully be able to go write some code in a notebook and we drop that in the pipeline and everyone's happy. It's not like, oh, we've got six months where we have to go get this feature on the engineering schedule and have lots of like Jira items we track and, you know, people turn gray and lose hair and, uh, you know, it should be easy to put new science into the platform as needed. Um, and so are you saying, other, Ben, the platform yeah. should be customized so that it could cater different uh, kind of users? It should be extensible. It should be easily extensible. And so to the extent that it makes sense, a lot of this infrastructure should provide a generic science capability, particularly in the analysis part of the pipeline. Um, you may want to make it easy to add metrics. You may not, depending on how that's controlled in your organization. Uh, in, you know, that's something that goes back to our earlier comment about choosing good metrics. And you need to think about what's the right way to do that. Um, and also the other thing that the platform does, which is really important, is we have lots of attrition in the industry. And so there's certain key um, knowledge that you want to institutionalize in the platform so that if I lose my key person who's measuring some aspect of marketing, that business process isn't down where we're spending months unable to think about how we're going to spend a hundred million dollars on advertising, right? The platform should have key mission critical knowledge like that in it. So if we lose personnel, we're not dead in the water. Mm. So just follow on that topic. So how do we sort of institutionalize the knowledge uh, in the case of uh, mobility, mobility of people? Anyone does it have to be Ben. So like in a simple case, you know, I've done a lot of work on performance marketing. So, you know, you probably have a specific set of ads you support, you know, they're on Google, they're on Meta, wherever, and you've come up with some measurement methodology that you think is good and you would want to automate that to the extent that's possible. This kind of offsite, these offsite marketing experiments are hard because you don't control everything, right? Some of it's running out on Google or Meta or whatever platform, Bing, and that makes this much more challenging. Mm -hmm. So you would want to automate the things that are sensible to do, um, not just to make sure that you eliminate errors and they happen reliably, but also so that uh, hopefully a, a new MBA can run these kinds of mission critical things without requiring scientists. Uh, the other thing we haven't talked about is you grow the platform, you need to have the necessary human capital in your organization to run experiments. So that may mean you just need, you know, someone who's a data scientist from a boot camp, or it may be something more sophisticated where you need a team of PhDs who produce research papers and can solve thorny problems when things go pear-shaped for bizarre and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so far we have been talking about experimentation, but the people side is also very important, human capital. Uh, actually, there are several questions asking that um, in terms of what kind of skills uh, will causal analysis team uh, be looking for. So um, several panelists here are uh, not only practitioners in, in causal and experimentation, but also managers, people managers. So in terms of skills, what what are some of the most desirable skills that we would want to look for in people into this space? Sathya, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, there's, there's technical skills, uh, I'm sorry, I should be specific. There's statistical technical skills, there's engineering, coding-based technical skills, uh, there's an understanding of um, uh, of the business product aptitude uh, and communications uh, that uh, that are important, uh, and then everything else that you may want to test for uh, you know for to make sure that somebody fits within your organization and uh, culturally um, uh, on a holistic basis. Let's say on the statistics side, um, you know, pick up any sort of like advanced stats uh, textbook on both statistical inference, causal inference specifically. Um, most of that is like foundational knowledge that, that you would need if, if you wanna be a deep practitioner of 
of uh, of this discipline um if you if you are mainly interested in just running experiments i think foundational basic stats and understanding of of p values uh, you know how you know basic regressions all the foundational statistical knowledge is is probably key uh, if you're not in a technical di discipline and you're not a scientist right and then add to that uh, depending on your role you may want to have the ability to pull your own data uh, you know write write some code in r or python you know in a notebook somewhere and then if you want to uh, get more advanced and and work on the platforms then you need to step up your coding skills uh, as well uh, but I, I'd say my teams are, are business facing and, and we we interact pretty heavily uh, with product managers and, and, and business managers, engineering, all the cross-functional uh, teams uh, at Netflix. So we specifically look for product aptitude, business aptitude, general critical thinking, communications uh, to sort of round out that, that science profile. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now I want to switch topic a little bit because uh, so far on this this uh, section, uh, a lot of discussions have been focused on experimentation, especially experimentation platform. Now, what about cause inference? So, when should we introduce cause inference? Uh, despite that, I think one panelist mentioned experimentation is the is the golden standard uh, for getting causality. At the same time, we all understand it's going to be very expensive, sometimes impractical to do. So when shall we introduce cause inference and how do we build up the capacity uh, in organization to be able to run rigorous cause inference? So I can start. Um, so sure. I think that um, observational causal inference um, you know, there are methodologies, there are some methodologies that are more rigorous than others. Um, I think the best combination of observational causal and experimentation is when experimentation is, you know, very expensive, um, use observational causal as a precursor to inform whether or not an experiment should be run. Um, of course, there are situations where experimentation is um, just not possible and people resort to uh, observational causal. Um, there are benchmarking um, papers out there that uh, basically compares um, observational causal results to um, experimentation results. Um, so they take um, an experiment where we know the ground truth from the experiment and apply um, observational causal methods to try to uncover um, the experimental estimate. And the result of those papers show that sometimes observational causal methods uh, fall pretty far from the ground truth. Um, and so- So you're talking about a paper by uh, Ronnie Kohavi? I, I, th I think there are multiple papers, okay. um, multiple benchmarking papers. Um, so I think like in, ter in terms of your question about uh, platformizing, um, observational causal methods. At LinkedIn, we do have such a platform called Ocelot, um, where data scientists can, you know, leverage a variety of observational causal methods with just a few clicks. And we have built in validations. Um, and so platformizing solutions are always um, a good idea. Not only does it democratize these methodologies to people who, um, don't know the exact, uh, you know, methodology detail. Um, they also save data scientists time, um, and they um, save uh, data scientists from, you know, human error when trying to implement these methodologies in their own Python notebook. Hmm, that's interesting. What is it called again? Well, at LinkedIn, it's called Ocelot. Ocelot. Okay. Very cool. So I, I do want to follow up on one point you made, Ian. So you, you suggested that uh, cause inference could be introduced as a precursor before experimentation. So how do we know, see, after, after cause inference, how do we know we should run an experimentation or not? Um, so, you know, usually um, if, you know, if the causal method, um, let's say, reveals that 
you know, there is, there is somewhat of a causal effect. There is something of a causal effect to be detected. Um, and it's significant enough that could be, you know, picked up by an experiment. Um, and so, uh, for example, you know, one, one area where experimentation um, could be very expensive is in cases where there are um, very few samples. So we have um, a, a, an issue of power. So an experiment has to last very long. Um, and so in those cases, if observational causal methods can inform whether there is indeed um, something of an effect there, that could inform whether or not an experiment, um, a lawn experiment should even be run. Okay, that's interesting. That's very helpful. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Satya, your hands is up. Yeah, so my um, my teams, we, uh, we also do a fair amount of um, non-AB testing type causal inference. Uh, and I would say two big buckets. We do observational studies when we cannot randomize uh, uh, at all or, or the change is being made by a third party uh, that, uh, that impacts uh, the Netflix business. So let's say, you know, Comcast goes or, or Disney goes and, and does a big promotion and we see our metrics changing and, and we have no control over that. So we use many of these techniques to understand what the uh, what the impact was and if we need to to make any adjustments to our strategies as a result. There is a layer in between unit randomized experiments and, and observational, which uh, we call, and I believe it's standard terminology as well, they're called quasi-experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here we don't randomize units at their most granular level, but we instead randomize groups of units. So the most obvious one is geo. So we could say that, hey, if you're running a global quasi experiment, we can say that if it's the Nordics uh, behave similar to each other in terms of the metrics that we see. So maybe we put Finland and Norway in, in one group and, and Sweden and Denmark in the, in the other group, right? Uh, and then these then have a time series component to, uh, to, to it as well. And so we have a set of other uh, causal inference methods that, that provide us more power than observational situations, but definitely less power than, than unit randomized ones. Okay, pretty cool. Now for the, th thank you everyone. It's, it's been very interesting discussion, but I do want to leave some time for the, audience or for us to answer questions from the audience. Um, hey, hey, Paul and the German, so can the audience attendees speak or they just, the only way for them to ask questions to the Q&A? Yes, uh, the audience can raise hands and then we can uh, unmute them and your co-host, so you should also be able to do that. Okay, so let me do this. Uh, give the limited time left. Uh, let me uh, read out. I might combine some some questions in the Q and A if they appear to be similar, and if it's not clear, I would ask uh, uh, the the names behind to uh, to elaborate. All right. So let me move on to the top of the list. Um, okay, there are several questions um, that I think they can be combined. So they they ask that a lot of the. Uh, difficult assumptions or the modeling techniques, uh, the com complexity of the method. So how, how can data scientists convey the confidence in the results to the management? Uh, given that the methodology is so complicated, there are a lot of things, some people mentioned supta, ignorability, et cetera. And, and those may not be the familiar terms for most of the day-to-day -day managers and the product managers uh, and so on. So how do we convey the confidence in results? Anyone would like to start to the business side? So I think yeah, being able to communicate is super important. And it's something like I certainly struggled with early in my career. I wrote lots of white papers that no one read and didn't result in decisions and just it wasted a lot of time. And so I think it's really important to learn how to communicate to executives. Um, I, I'm sure everyone in this room has got horror stories and uh, 
uh, stories about like victories where you finally managed to get through. And a lot of it's just being able to break it down, have it be very simple. Your language should be, at least at eBay, uh, we try to target like a, a new MBA. It's kind of like it should be written so a new MBA can understand it. And I try to keep that in my mind. I try to, you know, write something that's one pages and not 12. Uh, try not to put equations in it. Uh, graphs are really good. If you find the right visualization, that is often um, pivotal in um, getting someone to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyone else? Summit? Um, just to add to what ben Benjamin said, um, I think that's one of the reasons I like to keep things simple to begin with. Like, uh, a lot of complex methodologies with a lot of um, assumptions. Um, they are uh, not only more fragile, um, but also less democratizable because not everybody would understand it. And then you have, it has to come with a long disclaimer list to, to use it. So um, generally, like if, if this is something you have to do on a regular basis, and I know as Satya was saying, you, you, you need to have a very strong relationship with product managers, the decision makers to understand their language and what they really care about. So understand your audience really well, and then um, try to develop like a template or a standardized way of presenting your results so that if they've seen that once, they can quickly like understand any other result you might produce or share next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Eric? I think it's important also to not work under the assumption that you have to go all the way over to every business user and everyone in the business and like make it work for them. I think there's also part of what you have to focus on is where do you want people's basic level of, you know, knowledge to be, right? For product managers, marketers, and are there ways to get them up to speed in a way that you're not having to go customize and make every individual person happy or tell them a story that makes sense for their background. And so I think, you know, saying like working with a business partner comes off often as like treating them like they don't know much, but I think there are ways to actually say like they have a really good facility with this part of statistics or experimentation and then it becomes easier to create that and <clears throat> create that partnership over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. The next question I'm going to read out, um, I don't know if we have already addressed or not, is about uh, uh, experimentation agility, probably related to the speed point Ian e. mentioned. So how, what do you guys recommend to do under traffic limitation? So what should we do if there's no power, no sample? sufficient sample size? I mean, there are different methodological advances to, um, to reduce variance um, and also to test things offline. Um, so, you know, like the question, um, like the commenter uh, post, post um, the traffic online is limited. Um, and so to the extent that we can reduce variance um, in our experimentation estimate, that will help with um, getting more precise of an estimate with um, less sample. Um, there are also ways to do offline policy evaluation, especially when it comes to um, testing different variants of an AI model. Um, and, and that is also something that could be used to narrow down the set of AI models that we decide to test online. Okay, okay, that's helpful. Um, I, I wanna combine several other questions together, um, which are very interesting. Uh, they are, they're all about cause inference from observational data. Um, now, now you mentioned that in so uh, several papers talk compare the evidence between the experimentation and the cause inference and some of them are way off from each other. Uh, but in the industry, very often we don't have the ground truth to compare to when we run cause inference. And also different methods may generate a different uh, results uh, when we look at the same of, of observational data. So 
how should how should people do, deal with that? No ground truth, and different uh, methods may generate different uh, results. And it's it's observational data, so we don't we don't have evidence from experimentation. So one way to think about correctness is there's a epistemological framework that comes from the nuclear industry called verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification, um, which I find is really useful because the first V is verification, which is did my code correctly implement the model? We don't worry about whether the model's correct. So you unit test, like make sure your code's correct. Step two is the validation. Does my model have fidelity to reality? And then uncertainty quantification is thinking through like ways my model could fail because I've made assumptions like maybe I assume sattva, but I've got interference or um, people are getting exposed to aspirin of different strengths because, you know, some were, you know, kept in the back of the warehouse for two years before they were given to people. Um, and so it gives you a rigorous way to think through um, your approach to the problem and whether you're likely to be correct. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, what is it called again? The that the standards? Oh, verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. There's a great book by Overkampf and Roy um, on that subject. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Uh, Sathya, I'll add a couple of things. I think it's never too early to start investing in the source of truth uh, and to build it out. So, uh, to to what a couple of other panelists mentioned, um, figure out what you've done in the past that is trustworthy uh, and, and start building that collection. Even if it's like five tests or, or three tests, like you have something to, to start off with uh, and then you can build that over, over, over time. Uh, the other um, piece I would, I would re-emphasize is just speak the, the language of the business, right? Like talk to them, see if the results of your analysis pass the smell test does it make sense that you would make this change in this part of the product and, and this is how your metrics change or not? Uh, so a lot of it is also just down to, you know, does the, do these results make sense or not? And then uh, getting the businesses buy in on, on that aspect of it. Okay, great. I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Now there's one question. Um, Victor, uh, uh, sorry, yes. Victor, I think we, we have uh, officially two more minutes. Yeah, so, I think so maybe should... one final yeah. one final question. So uh, this would be a very uh, quick answer question, I guess, for everyone. Uh, ideally, uh, uh, all the changes should be tested, right? Should be experimented, experimented and tested. Uh, what what should companies who are mid tier, uh, not not best in class, not a hundred percent test, but have been experimentation for many years? They have experimentation capacity, they have the culture, but they're, they're not that mature to test everything what should be a good number to target for in terms of percent percentage of changes to be tested given the limited resources limited time so 80 percent 50 percent 20 percent what should people target let me be um i guess uh say like it should be 100 <laughs> percent um the I think the call the 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 role of an experimentation platform or any platform in general should be to reduce the marginal cost of doing that same um, operation again and again. And um, it sh it shouldn't be that every like the next hundred experiments would cost you as much as the first hundred experiments. Um, so I would always I feel like the cost of doing something else and having a lot of confounding variables and assumptions behind it, they end up costing you more, especially if you end up shipping something bad or you miss something really, really um, wonderful because your assumptions were wrong. So um, I would always keep that goal 100%, but, but I'm biased. Okay, Maybe. thank you so much. Oh, Ian, yeah. Um, I was going to say that maybe the mental framework shouldn't be what percent of product launches should be tested, but rather how to prioritize them if you truly have limited capacity. Um, and prioritization has, you know, can probably be based on, um, you know, how impactful is the launch, 
is the launch? How, um, how widespread would the product be, um, be used um, or affect you know, end users or customers? Um, so I would think in terms of prioritization in instead of uh, percentages. All right, thank you so much. So uh, apologize, I can't read out all the questions, uh, but it's, it's been a very wonderful uh, panel session. Uh, and uh, hope if we're in person, uh, I would call a round of applause to everyone. Uh, they can use emojis, anything. I don't have anything. Oh, that's raise hands only. Okay, thank you so much. And then back to you, Paul and uh, German, and hope everyone will enjoy the rest of the conference.